So let's see, you get one for starting it. Does he get one for finishing it? Huh? Does he get one for finishing it? Sure. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay, so let's start with questions. Excuse me. What about the you know, I, I, I defined the displacement operator and said that would uh, give you a coherent state from the ground state of the harmonic oscillator. I'm actually going to start with uh, coherence. Uh, say something about coherent states in the beginning of the of the lecture, and then um, and then talk about the. Uh, Feynman propagator and um, try to relate the operator and path integral uh, formulations. So, let me start with providing something that um, I don't know if this is the best derivation, but it's it seems to me we ought to, since we use the eigenstates of the position operator and also the coherent states, um, we ought to have a formula for their inner product. So I'm going to derive that. Um, by the way, is I, I do have some of I have three old homeworks here. So after class, um, why don't if you don't have your old homework, come pick it up. Um, So, first of all, we have a formula for the coherent state, um, namely e to the minus a half alpha squared, and then a sum alpha to the n over the square root of n factorial to state n. And so, evidently, q alpha would be e to the minus a half alpha squared, and then a sum alpha to the n over the square root of n factorial qn. And this sum, of course, is from 0 to infinity. And the n state is the n state of the monic oscillator. And we have a formula for that. I'll remind you of what you learned in quantum mechanics class. If we let s, just to save some notation, to make the notation a little more Compact. If we let S be the square root of the mass of the uh, particle, the frequency of the oscillator, uh, the product of those two divided by H bar, and then you take the square root, then this thing is square root of S over 2 to the n, n factorial, square root of pi, e to the minus S cubed squared over 2, and then a Hermit polynomial of argument SQ. Okay. Now, you can see that obviously if you put these two things together, you get rather a complicated structure. However, there is a formula, a lovely formula, one of the, one of the remarkable things about classical mathematics well, one of the many remarkable things are the generating functions. And uh, the generating function of the Hamid polynomials is this exponential, which gives you a sum of y to the n over n factorial hn of x. So the Hamid polynomials are given by uh, this expression. This factor here is something that, of course, normalizes them correctly, um, because otherwise uh, polynomial integrated from squared and integrated from minus infinity and plus infinity would always diverge. OK, if we put these things together, and I'll put these notes on the web tonight. I, haven't yet done that. What we get is Q alpha 
is so going from this formula, what we get would be e to the minus a half alpha squared, and then a sum alpha dn over the square root of n factorial, and then this square root, which actually I wrote better that way than in my notes. So 2 to the n n factorial square root of pi. e to the minus s cubed squared over 2 hn of s cubed. I think I've got all the factors there. Any questions? Yes. Um, why did we throw in um, the s here? Why did I throw in? Yeah, why did we put that in? Why did I put the S there? Yeah. Well, otherwise we'd have M omega over M omega over H bar all over the place, and it'd be so confusing. Okay. It, it's just to make the thing easier to deal with. Okay. So, yeah. um, so I think this is going back to when you were first talking before. So, what exactly are we solving for here with these hermit polynomials? I mean, what is a Hermit polynomial? No, no, no. What, what are we solving with these Hermit polynomials? Well, we're trying to find the inner product of an eigenstate of the position operator with a coherent state. Okay. Okay. And the coherent state is a sum of the eigenstates of the uh, harmonic oscillator Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And. Um, so that's what I'm okay. computing here. It, it, okay, well, what we've got then is x. So in this formula up here, we simply set x equal to the argument of the big polynomial, which is s cubed. And we set y equal to the thing that's raised to the nth power. Well, the thing that's raised to the nth power is alpha over the square root of 2. And so this thing is the square root of s over the square root of pi e to the minus alpha squared over 2 minus s cubed squared over 2 plus square root of 2 s cubed alpha minus alpha squared over 2. So it actually rather simplifies. And if we now um, Proceed to your implicit request and bring back m omega over h bar, what we get is not so bad. It's m omega over pi h bar to the one quarter e to the minus alpha squared over 2 minus alpha squared over 2. So this is absolute value of alpha squared, this is just alpha squared. Minus m omega over 2h bar q squared plus square root of 2m omega over h bar times q alpha. So all that in the exponential. So what, that's what this thing is. And um, so for example, we derived these, we, we, we derived coherent state path integrals and position space path integrals. And to relate the two, to see that they actually um, agree with each other, one way to do it is to use this formula. Um, and then, for example, to go to the simplest case, which was um, that of a free particle. And um, we could uh, verify that. I'm not going to do that today, but we could do that later, or I could make a homework problem. Are some of you too cold? I am, but... <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I think I need some fresh air. I think it's warm around the side. I was going to open the windows in any case. The first sneeze I was going to open the windows. Um, but nobody sneezed, so I, I see we're shivering, so I am. Uh, if there's another, if there's a call for a sneeze, I'll open the two back. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So now, um, now I'm going to switch gears and go to the um, go back to the Feynman propagator, but look at it from the point of view of um, operators, annihilation creation operators, as opposed to uh, path integral. Um, and I see I've got things kind of upside down here. Well, I think I better follow the notes rather than try to rearrange them. So let's consider a scale field. Um, and it's uh, A of K, di kx plus a dagger of K is minus i K x dqk over, and now it's a square root of 2 pi q, uh, 2k0, let us say. k0 is the same thing as omega. Um, and of course, k dot x, kx is k vector dot x vector minus k0, x0, or equivalently, k dot x minus omega t. And once again, uh, z uses the opposite um, metric. He would have k dot x being uh, omega t minus k vector dot x vector. Okay, now we have these commutation relations, A of K, A dagger of let us say K prime is delta Q of K minus K prime. And um, A of K, so A, A, let me just say A, A prime is zero, and that's the same thing true of A prime dagger. Prime just means a different value of K. It's not a derivative. All right, now, the um, conjugate momentum pi of, let us say, x and t is, for this case, phi dot of x and t. And um, we showed in class that um, phi of x and t commutator pi of, say, y and t, the equal time commutator is i delta q of x minus y, and on the other hand, phi of x, t. In fact, in homework, you, you were supposed to show that this, or you're supposed to show, I guess, for next week, that this is 0, and then phi of uh, tx, phi of ty. And these things are the quantum field theoretic analog of the commutation relations qi pj is i delta ij uh, qi qj is zero pi pj is zero so that's what quantum field theory does it generalizes in this way and uh, generalizes quantum mechanics in this way. And um, whether this is absolutely the right thing to do is unclear, but this is standard quantum way to do it. Um, now, in class when we were talking about path integrals, we derived, um, uh, we introduced something called Z0 of J, and this was uh, 
The zero here means we're talking about free field theory. And this was zero time over product e to the i integral j of x phi of x t4 of x. And this is time ordered. And this is the ground state of the um, of the theory. And we showed that this was um, an integral e to the i integral j phi e4 of x plus i s0 phi and epsilon half integrated ratio that e to the i s0 phi and epsilon e phi. So that's what we were showing last time, well not last time, but we were talking about half this way. And um, this S0 of phi and epsilon is the action for a free field, and this is a half. And um, you can write it as phi dot squared minus grad phi squared minus m squared minus i epsilon. I'm going to use that note times phi squared t fourth x. Um, remember the what multiplies epsilon doesn't matter as long as it's positive and, and it's integrated over all of space time, more or less. So I'm, I'm being a little sloppy here, but otherwise, we, I mean, we did it correctly, so we, now we can be a bit sloppy. So this is also in a more relativistic notation. It looks like this. Field phi um, obeys the free field equation, and um, that free field equation is the Klein Gordon equation, m squared minus box on phi of x equals zero. I'll put the equal zero over here so that I can write out for you explicitly what this is. This is m squared minus um, Laplacian or grad squared, and then plus d by dt squared on phi of x is zero. And you can see, I hope, that this field here, okay. that, that this field satisfies that. And let me just show that explicitly. In fact, let me just go over here. I think we can forget about the coherent states for the moment. So the reason why that satisfies, that field satisfies, the, this is called the Klein-Gordon equation, by the way. The reason for that is that when you hit phi with m squared minus box, minus box, and box is um, we can write it this way. Well, this is m squared minus da da on this thing here, which is over there. And so that's uh, A of K, E to the I, K of X. Let me get the sign. I can never remember these signs. So it looks like that. Well, the m squared just sits there, but the d by d, um, so this is the m squared, and now this is going to be, let's do the space ones. Then this is uh, just the second space derivative, and that brings down uh, k vector, i k vector twice 
And so this is plus k vector squared, the i squared canceling the minus sign. In the case of the time derivative, we've got an extra minus sign from the Lorentz signature here. And so this is minus k0 squared on a e to the i kx. And over here, you get the same thing with an overall minus sign. Um, and it doesn't matter. And so this one is also m squared plus k vector squared minus k0 squared a dagger of k e to the minus i kx q k over the square root of 2 pi q 2 k0. Okay, well this is 0 because uh, this, this particle that we're describing has mass m. And so k0 is simply defined as the square root of m squared plus k vector squared. In other words, that's what we call omega or omega sub k. And so when you put in the square of that, you exactly cancel. And so this is just 0. So that, so the field, this free field satisfies the klein gordon equation. This is how, a, this is called a free field. It's called a free field because it satisfies a, a, a linear field equation. The action, moreover, is uh, quadratic in the fields. The Hamiltonian is quadratic in the fields. You can solve this field theory uh, exactly. Um, Okay, so we used path integrals uh, a couple of weeks ago to show that C0 of J, in fact, is just e to the i over 2, an integral J of x, the Feynman propagator of x minus x prime, J of x prime, d fourth x, d fourth x prime. So it has this very simple formula of an exponential. And then, and this delta, which is also called, it's also, it's often written with the subscript f for Feynman, is equal to an integral e to the i p x minus x prime d fourth p over p squared plus n squared minus i epsilon, and then over here, 2 pi to the fourth. And so what you see is that this is a very nice expression in the momentum space. And um, what we showed uh, in class was that, um, let me use this space here so I don't have to erase everything. 1 over i, the variational derivative of z0 of j with respect to j of x. Well, that was 0, time ordered product, phi of x, e to the i integral, let's say j of x prime, phi of x prime, d4 of x prime. I think there should be, I think I should have written this primes there. Um, whoops, I have to finish that though. So that's the first derivative, and then we show then we found then that the the uh, that if you so you differentiate this way you get this, but that's that's if you did all right, I'm, I'm being a little bit. We have two expressions for this. We can write it this way, or we can say it is time ordered product of e to the i integral j phi d fourth x in the ground state. So if we differentiate this expression, we get that. If we differentiate this expression, 
we get that this is equal to um, C0 J times integral the Feynman propagator J of X prime D4 of X prime. Okay. Now you take a second derivative, second function derivative of both sides. You differentiate this one, you differentiate that one, and then you set J equal zero. Well, setting J equal zero means that this thing goes to one, and um, so when you differentiate, you, you bring down another phi, and what you get then is that one over I squared, the second variational derivative of Z zero of J with respect to say J of X, J of X prime is the mean value in the vacuum of the time order product of phi of x with phi of x prime. And we find that that's equal to minus i. And let me write an f there. It's, in other words, the Feynman propagator. Um, so, in other words, if you take the if you take the second derivative, you differentiate this with respect to j, then set j equal zero. Well, obviously, you get delta x minus x prime. This thing goes to one, and if you do this one carefully, uh, you then get uh, this expression. All right. Are there any questions about that? I'm just sort of reviewing something that we've seen already. All right, well now, what I wanted to show you is that we get something, um, we can derive this same expression, namely that the mean value in the ground state of the free field theory, the time order product of two fields, is the Feynman propagator, where the Feynman propagator is given by this expression. We can derive that just from our expression for the field, where this field uh, is depending upon space and time. So there are two sort of different points of view here. Um, well, many points of view. There's the pattern role and the operator point of view. There's also the equal time uh, commutation relation point of view in which the t is fixed and sometimes we just set it equal to zero and then there's the actual behavior of the field which solves the klein gordon equation so that x is a ball vector spatial x and time. Okay, well, questions? Am I going too slow or too fast? I'm sure I'm not going at the right speed. <laughs> I, I, I need signals from you people because... Um, it's a good review. It's good. I say it's good. This is the right speed. Yeah, it's good to review seems this. like a decent review. What? It seems like you're getting enough review. I think we're non-responsive because it's the evening before fall break. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I teach on Monday and Wednesday, so fall break break is just keeping invisible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't even get to Columbus Day. Was there a question? Okay, so... um. I want to do a couple of things now in terms of the this operator language. And as I was writing these notes, um, I was convinced mentally that the operator point of view was so much easier and simpler and more straightforward. And then I went through actually doing the thing this afternoon, and I was 
pulling these latent formulas from actually from my book. And then I realized that in fact the operator formalism is really very lengthy. And it only seemed to me that it was more straightforward and simpler because it's what I learned as a graduate student. I learned that first. In fact, Pathing was one of the old common in physics courses when I was a graduate student. All right, so I wanted to find, first of all, I want to set this equal to phi plus of x plus phi minus of x. Plus and minus refer to what's called the positive frequency part. That's this. And the negative frequency part, that. And so phi plus of x. And people often put the plus in parentheses, but that's a lot of trouble, so I'm just going to make it plus. Phi plus of x then is an integral e to the i, and if we're really explicit, it's um, switching to p, it's p dot x minus p0 x0, a of p, d cubed p over 2 pi cubed 2 p0. And p0, again, is, it's not the paint of Pizarro, it's p0 is the square root of m squared plus p squared. Phi minus is just the adjoint of this. It's phi plus adjoint. And that is an integral p e to the minus i p dot x minus p0 x0, a dagger of p d cubed p over square root of 2 pi cubed 2 p0. So these are called the positive and negative frequency parts. The term positive and negative frequency part frequency. Positive and negative frequency, these are historical conventional terms and they're <coughs> they may fall into disuse, but anyway. Okay, now let's look at the commutator of phi plus with phi minus. What do you say that these phi plus and phi minus represent? What do they? What, what did you say that these represented? They're called the positive and negative frequency parts. That's for historical reasons. Huh? Well, yeah, it's it's the, the the positive frequency part consists only of the annihilation operator, so it annihilates the vacuum. And the uh, negative frequency part doesn't. It creates, it turns the vacuum into a blast of uh, a superposition of single particle states, uh, one for every momentum. So it's, um, you wouldn't want to be near the vacuum when the when phi minus hit it. Okay, let's compute this then. Well, it's going to be an integral of course, d cubed p, d cubed q, over 2 pi cubed, square root of, uh, well, I pulled out the 2, square root of q0, p0, e to the i px minus i, Qy, these are four vectors, and now this commutator, a of p, a dagger of q. But the commutator, of course, exactly where it's occurring, just where I erased it, but you remember that it's, this is, this is, uh, this commutator is just a delta function of p minus q. Let's see, is the, is the camera in? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So, 
what, is, what does that mean? And that means what we have here is dqp e to the i p x minus y. Since p, three vector p is three vector q, q0 and p0 are the same. And so this is just dq, uh, two pi q, two p0. And that's it. That's all it is. Now, this is a Lorentz invariant function that traditionally is called delta plus of x minus y. Um, how do you know it's Lorentz invariant? Well, um, I guess there are various ways. One way is to say this is a Lorentz invariant in the product. And I hope you learned it was special relativity cause that dqp over p0 is the Lorentz invariant. Um, on the other hand, if you want, I can sort of prove that for you. Namely, clearly, p fourth p is the Lorentz invariant. And d fourth p times delta of, let us say, p squared, let me get the signs right, p squared plus m squared p squared is the Lorentz in a product of p with p. So this is Lorentz invariant, that's Lorentz invariant. What is this? Well, you know the formula for a delta function of a function. It's, so this is dqp, then we have dp0, <coughs> then we have delta of, what is this? It's p vector squared plus m squared minus p0 squared. So that delta function, let me just write the formula for the delta. Delta of f of x is a sum over the zeros of, of x, of f, of um, delta of x minus x0 divided by the absolute value of the derivative of x at x0. So that's a, that's a standard delta function formula. Yeah. For uh, this commutator, um, the q's, are those q's, those don't have anything to do with position. Those are just another representation of momentum, right? Yeah. Q is three momentum. Right. Great question. By the way, I could have brought, in fact, I could run to my office and get some fresh grapes. If some of you would prefer grapes that are healthy, which are healthier than chocolate, raise your hands and I'll run and get the grapes. Because on the other hand, if I throw you a grape with my <laughs> chocolate, my chocolate, my chalky hand, uh, maybe that isn't such a good idea. All right, so now you've got to give me some guidance here. Um, this double function formula, have you seen that in class? Good. Have you seen that in math methods? What? Methods? Math methods? Good. Methods. Now, so let's apply it to this. Well, if we apply it to that, we we'll see we have to divide by the derivative of this with respect to p0. Well, that's just 2p0. So this is, and it just sets p0 equal to the square root of p squared plus m squared, or plus or minus that. And so there are then, um, so this is delta of p vector squared. Plus Actually, it's. Oh, let me get this right. It's it's it's. Oh, we, we do the integration. 
over P0. So this is just integral dQp over uh, 2P0. And um, the case where you get the wrong side for P0, that just doesn't work. Um, well, actually, it does work. So if, if we are actually do, just doing this computation, we would get two of them. And so it would, would look like this. Uh, I'm sorry. Where P0, of course, is square root of P squared plus M squared. Okay. And so since this was relativistically invariant, that's relativistically invariant. Okay. So this is one of the invariant delta functions. And um, if if x is space-like, or x minus y is space-like, that is to say the space part is bigger than the time part, then uh, there's a nice formula for this, um, which I found in Weinberg volume 1, page 202. And it's the delta plus of, um, how shall I write this? Well, it's Lorentz invariant, um, so let's just call it zero r vector. That makes it really space like. And then it's m over 4 pi squared r times something called k1 of uh, mr, where this is a Hinkle uh, uh, function. And uh, the leading term is um, uh, the R, it's the leading term is 1 over 4 pi squared R squared. I have all the terms in the notes here, but let's just do the leading terms. So the question is, yeah. that's been set to zero. Is that Say it again. Yeah. A time. I said the time. I said the time. I'm saying that this is Lorentz invariant. Let's look at it for the space-like case. For the space-like case, we can set the um, the time equal to zero and just leave the space part. And that makes it easier for me to say what R is. Equivalently, delta plus of x, if x squared is greater than 0, is m over 4 pi squared square root of Lorentz invariant x squared k1 of m square root of x squared, where this is the 4 vector. This x squared here is x dot x minus t squared, or minus x0 squared. Okay, so this is this Lorentz invariant. Now, this Feynman propagator, as I think I've already said, it's a Green's function for the Klein Gordon operator. Remember, the field satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation. That is to say, m squared minus box on this is zero. And so, and so this is the Green's function for that. The Green's function in general is something that basically inverts. You have a differential operator, it hits the Green function, you get a delta function. And um, that essentially means the reason why these things are are nice is that um, 
if you write something, some, let us say, some field five of x as an integral of, let us say, delta f of x minus y, um, Then what happens is n squared minus box on phi of x. And what does that do? That hits this, and we get delta of x minus y, f of y, d4 of y. And that's just f of x. So in other words, this, this if you take the Green's function, multiply it by whatever, you get a solution of the inhomogeneous equation, m squared minus box on phi equals whatever. And um, so what you would say then is that if you want a solution of this inhomogeneous equation, you let phi of x equal phi zero of x plus, where phi zero of x is just this thing here. In other words, the solution of the homogeneous equation, m squared minus box phi equals zero, take that solution, you add to it the Feynman propagator anything else, and that gives you a solution of the homogeneous equation. Okay. Now, as I said, the, 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 well, I have to show you that this, in fact, is a Green's function of this. And the reason is um, pretty simple. Namely, if m squared minus box hits the Feynman propagator, well, what is the Feynman propagator? It would be m squared minus box on um, e to the i, let us say, qx over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon d fourth q over 2 pi to the fourth. So when m squared minus box hits this, m squared just sits there, and we have m squared, but minus box gives us q squared. And we have, and then the denominator we have m squared minus i epsilon plus q squared e to the i qx d fourth q over 2 pi to the fourth. And um, when we have an expression of the form x over x minus i epsilon, this is the same thing as x over x, which is 1. And so we, we have just e to the i qx, d fourth q over 2 pi to the fourth. And of course, that's equal to delta 4 of x. Okay. So we, we've seen that the Feynman propagator is the Green's function for the Klein Gordon operator. Now the question is. Um, what is this uh, Feynman propagator? Can we, can we, um, we see that it's a Green's function for the Klein-Gordon operator, but can we get a simple form for it? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to relate it to these invariant delta functions, delta in, in a different sense, capital delta, capital delta. Any questions? There hasn't been a question for a while. Yes. So why do you call it green function? Why what? You call it green function. Why is it green's function? Yeah, yeah. Well, in general, the green's function is something that when a differential operator oh, hits okay. it, you get a delta function. Okay. And we've just seen that that's the case. Good question. Another quick, maybe trivial one. 
Um, so when we have m squared minus box on the Feynman propagator, how come we don't have a minus q0 squared? The q0 squared is in there. q squared here that can be that is q vector squared minus q0 squared. Good question. And that because it's a box. And that's the def and in the case of the Feynman propagator, that's what this is. Why the Feynman propagator? The Feynman propagator is, uh, is, is clearly Lorentz invariant because this is Lorentz invariant. This is the four vector inner product. This is the four vector inner product of Q squared with itself. And then this is the d fourth Q. You might say, well, why is it that d fourth Q is invariant? And the reason for that is, um, is quite cute, actually. It's that um, the Lorentz group is the set of special, it's S031. S means determinant one. So the, 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 the Lorentz matrices all have determinant one. And if something has determinant one, well how does, how does D fourth Q change? D fourth Q prime, well this would go as the Jacobian times d fourth q, where the Jacobian is the determinant of the partial of, of, of q prime with respect to q, where this is, you, 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 you have um, the first row, say, is partial of q prime 1, q prime 0, q prime 1, q prime 2, q prime 3, with respect to q 0. And then all of them with respect to q 1, Q2, Q3. But this, it, these are just the elements of the Lorentz matrix. So this is just the determinant, it's the determinant of this. So this is just the determinant of the Lorentz matrix, the 4 by 4 Lorentz matrix. Is this colder than it is inside? Mm -hmm. I think so. Huh? At this point, I think so. You think so? All right, well, I haven't done any sneezes, so we can shut this. I can see what this sneeze. I knew that they would get the air conditioning going when winter came. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. Let's see, it's actually story time, but do I have a story? I... All right, I, I, did I tell you the Weinberg story about when he won the Nobel Prize? About oh, I did, I did yeah, tell you, you right? yeah, I told you that. All right, um, I'm, I'm going to... I told you about Jimmy Carter and Three Mile Island, didn't I? Okay. Did I tell you about what Wilson said of Chernobyl? The design of Chernobyl? Okay. Richard Wilson is a professor of physics at Harvard. Well, he's emeritus now. He's about 85. Um, born in 29, so he's 83 or so. Anyway, um, he uh, has been studying safety issues, nuclear and chemical, for uh, many years. And um, when the Chernobyl disaster occurred, he uh, went to the Soviet Union, and he uh, was then in the Soviet Union, and uh, gave them some advice. And, um, he said that um, the Chernobyl reactor was designed as if it was going to be run by geniuses. And on the other hand, the people who, used, who ran this Chernobyl nuclear reactor manipulated the dials as though the reactor had been designed by geniuses. And um, 
that was the reason why they got into trouble. Um, uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to design any complicated piece of equipment so that it can be run by idiots and um, and then if you're running the thing you're supposed to be really careful and assume that the people who designed it were morons and um, and then uh, then you're super cautious when you design it and super cautious when you use it and apparently in, in the case of the trend or the opposite um, I wanted to say something, but it, it somehow skipped my mind. What Richard Wilson was saying? Excuse me? What Wilson was saying? What? What Wilson was saying? Well, that's what Wilson said. He yeah. said that, that the problem was that instead of, instead of designing it very carefully and then operating it very carefully, they, in, in, this, in the case of Chernobyl, they did the opposite. They did a sloppy design and then uh, assumed that the people running it would be all PhD experimental nuclear physicists, right. and then the that. the people running it weren't anything like that, and they assumed that this was a terrific Soviet nuclear reactor, and it must have been designed by um, Sakharov. Okay. I thought you had something to add. That's why. I yeah, I do. I oh, thank you. I I just remembered what I had to add. I was teaching elementary physics. And I don't know if this is physics 102 or 160 or 161 or 262, but it was one of the freshman or sophomore courses. And one of the students in it mentioned to me that he had previously run a nuclear reactor in California. <laughs> and so the scary, the scary thing was, in other words, that the people running the nuclear reactors, and this was this would have been in the 1990s or 1980s, uh, was um, somebody who hadn't taken freshman physics. And he was now taking it at UNM. <laughs> and, um, and I also remember advertisements in the newspapers, in particular in the Wall Street Journal, um, by uh, the companies that made the nuclear power plants in those days, and they called them turnkey nuclear reactors, like a car. You, know, you put the key in the car and you turn it and the batteries work and the, the, the engine starts. And the idea was that the nuclear reactor was a symbol to operate and all you did was turn a key. And they, that's actually the way they advertised it. And then when there was this incident at Three Mile Island, which as I said was was in fact, uh, I mean, nobody, nobody was um, hurt by the radiation, but um, the nuclear power industry went into the toilet because uh, the media made such a made it made such a big deal of it, and um, there was a movie with Jane Fonda called um, The China Syndrome. That movie and the Three Mile Island disaster. Well, it wasn't even a disaster, but it happened at the same time. So the nuclear industry went down the toilet. And the result was that coal, there was an enormous resurgence of coal, and you know, the air pollution of coal, as I've said, kills more than 10,000 Americans every year. And then, of course, it's also the main cause of global warming is the generation of electricity from coal. States. Well, in the United States and China, it's the generation of electricity from coal in China. In India, it's probably something else. Anyway. All right, so that's the story. Um, I guess it wasn't as much fun as some of the other stories. I think it was better when Wilson told it. Okay, so let's um, let's see if we can get some distance here with what this um, thing is. This fine property. Of the 
uh, if we just write it as x, and we split up the d fourth q into d cubed q over 2 pi cubed, and then this integral minus infinity plus infinity d q zero over 2 pi, and then e to the i q dot x minus q zero x zero, and then down here, we will have uh, q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And let me over, maybe over, over here write q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. Well, we can write this as q dot q uh, minus q zero squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And now we can rewrite that as eq, well maybe q, minus i epsilon prime minus q zero. eq minus i epsilon prime plus q zero plus epsilon prime squared. So I've written this so what's EQ? Huh? What is EQ? What is? The EQ, what is it? What is EQ? Yes. EQ is what I was previously calling Q0. Um, what I was calling Q0 when, when Q0 was the square root of n squared plus Q squared. But here, and by the way, there's jargon associated with that. If p0 is p squared, is the square root of p squared plus m squared, then the four vector p is said to be on the mass shell. Whereas here we're integrating over all, all four vectors q. And um, so eq is the square root of q vector squared plus m squared. So it's the energy of the particle that has momentum q. And what's epsilon prime? Epsilon prime is just uh, epsilon over 2 eq. So I'm just rewriting this. The eq squared is, of course, q squared minus q, q squared plus m squared. Then um, minus q0 times q0 is minus q0 squared. Okay. Then you get these cross terms. And you get minus i epsilon prime eq, minus i epsilon prime eq. So what that gives you is minus 2i epsilon prime eq. But epsilon prime is epsilon over 2 eq. So this is just minus i epsilon. So that's what. So that's the minus i epsilon. And then on the other hand, you get minus i epsilon prime times minus i epsilon prime is minus epsilon prime squared. And so I'm canceling with the epsilon prime squared here. Okay. So then we can write this as And I'm going to flip the sign of both of the. I'm going to ignore epsilon prime squared because it's too small to care about. And I'm going to flip the sign of these two. And so this is going to look like this q0 minus eq minus i epsilon. And I'm going to drop the prime on epsilon because the only thing that epsilon is is a small positive number. And this is q0 minus minus eq plus i epsilon and did i in my notes i have an overall minus sign on So let me see, what did I? Oh, uh, the minus 
Edison's from the Q0 in the first term, I think. So this one and that one differ by a minus sign, right? right. The other one does not oh, and this one and that one don't differ by a minus sign. Very good. So that's fine. There's a minus sign in my notes. So you really earned that one. By the way, where is this? Um, huh? We had an additional plus epsilon prime squared. Is that not? Oh, yeah, good? that's completely trivial. Oh, it's it's very small. Small. Yeah. Yeah. But it's worth a chalk. Okay. So now, what we've got is a contour integral problem. This is a complex variable problem. And um, so where are these poles? Well, there's a pole here, EQ, or, yeah, that should be minus EQ, wow. Minus EQ minus I epsilon, EQ minus I epsilon. So there are two poles, one here and one there. And we're integrating along here from this is the Q0 plane. And so what can we do? Well, uh, we're, we're, what we're looking at here is e to the minus i q0 x0. The q dot x we can pull out, so I can put this here, e to the i q dot x. And then this is just e to the minus i q0 x0. So if x0 is positive, what do we want? What do we want to do? If x0 is positive, we want to go into the lower half plane. We add what I like to call a ghost contour. It's a contour whose integral, it's a contour along which the complex integral is zero. So I call it a ghost contour. So you can add this contour in the bottom and you pick up this pole. And so, what you get then, is um, you're picking up, uh, let us see, where's the pole? It's this one. You're picking up this pole, and so Q0 gets replaced by minus EQ, no, by plus EQ, and so you have two EQ here, and what we get is um, integral dq q e to the i q dot x two pi q, and we get i e to the minus i, and this two pi is used up e to the minus i e q x zero, because q zero is e q. And we're dividing by 2eq. And then when, and so this is multiplied by theta of x0. In other words, it contributes only if x0 is positive. And on the other hand, if x0 is negative, we go around this way. Oh, and notice this was clockwise. So there's a minus sign. The top one is counterclockwise, but when Q0 is set equal to minus EQ, then over here we get a minus sign from over there. The upshot is that if you keep track of these signs, what you get is that you, there's an overall, there is an overall i, and so what you wind up with is this formula, minus i, delta Feynman, 
of x is theta of x zero, and look at what, what we're left with. It's d cubed q e to the i q dot x, um, and this is the vector part of that, minus i e q x zero over uh, q zero, q zero in the, in the on mass shell sense, in other words, e q. This thing is exactly the same as delta plus. Okay, d q p, the energy of the, of the state, the positive energy square root of momentum squared plus mass squared, and then the four vector inner product, the Minkowski inner product of the two four vectors, but with p on the mass shell, that is p zero is square root of p squared plus m squared. And so what we get then is And this is then delta plus of, and let me say what the delta plus is. It's delta plus of x vector minus x zero. Okay. Now that looks a little, this doesn't look as nice as it should. But if we look at our formula for delta plus, especially if we look at it if we simplify it a little bit, so that instead of x minus y, we just have x. So let's just look at x. So this is delta plus of x. Now, what happens if you flip the sign of x? You put a minus sign here. Well, that means you put a minus sign there. Let me get this straight now. Oh, it's insensitive. It's rather suppose so this is delta x. Suppose we write delta of x zero minus x. Well that means that we flip the sign. We've had this minus p dot x minus p zero x zero. If we flip the sign of the spatial x, we flip the sign there. But we can just flip the sign of p, because we're integrating over all p, and this is an even function of p. So what we get is that this is equal to delta plus of x0 and x. So in other words, we can write delta plus of x vector minus x zero is equal to delta plus of minus x vector minus x zero, which is just delta plus of minus x. So that's the standard formula for the Feynman propagator, namely that in this Lorentz invariant function, we just write this as minus four vector x, and that makes it a much nicer formula. All right, well, we'll pick this up next time. Let me just see where we are. All right, so I guess we can stop recording. And do, 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 is there a question? Well, we'll have a nice fall break.